Good morning, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome. Had to unmute myself there for just a moment. Welcome, everyone, to today's session. Uh, this is the GEG Louisiana Distance Learning Series. Um, this is brought to you in partnership with LA Ed Chat, My PD 24 7, and Stream Yard. All right, all right, let's check in. If everyone could. Take a moment and check in. I see quite a few people in the chat already. Uh, shout out, look at Amanda in there. Awesome, awesome. Hi, Amanda, how are you? And then we've got, uh, uh, we've got Amanda from Louisiana here. We've got Carol coming in from Florida. We've got uh, Kansas City, Carmen. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. Uh, Reem, how are you in Egypt? How are you this morning? Good morning, good morning, good morning. All right, just going to give a few quick shout outs to you all there. So we have people checking in from all over. Uh, we've got Mississippi and uh, South Louisiana. Uh, virtual hugs to you as well. Virtual hugs to all of you as well. And so, um, all right, and then give a shout out to uh, Sherry out there in Houston as well. Awesome, 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 awesome. Thank you all for taking uh, a quick little minute to join us this morning on this great Saturday morning right here. Uh, we also wanna send a quick shout out to StreamYard for uh, sponsoring this episode. That's the platform that we are using to, um, to share all of this goodness this morning. And I'm telling you, you have a treat in store for you today. And uh, just for those of you who do not know me, my name is Wally Brazier V. I am the uh, I'm a level one uh, certified educator, a Google certified trainer and uh, innovator and administrator. But I'm also the uh, I'm also the GEG Louisiana uh, leader. Shout out to all the captains. I appreciate you all. Desiree uh, uh, and Tyler as well. We have a few more people who we are on board. And if you want to get in touch and become a member, I will be sharing some of that information in just a moment. Uh, but with this moment, we also want to take a uh, moment of silence for all of the things that have been happening in our country of the U.S. Uh, you know, we just had another uh, issue in Rochester, New York. We know that we recently had one there in Kenosha. And so we just want to take a moment of silence to recognize um, and acknowledge all of the events that have been happening here. All right, so let's get it started. Um, if you want to learn more about GEG Louisiana, uh, you can go to GEGLouisiana.com. We are there. Uh, we are also on Facebook. We are also on Twitter. We also have our Google group and we are also on Instagram. But you have the opportunity that if you go to that one website, that GEGLouisiana.com, um, you'll be able to uh, join all of our different platforms right from there. OK. And then today. Oh, my gosh, you all. Oh, my gosh, you all. We have this young lady joining us. Her name is Casey Boyd. Good morning, Casey. How are you? Uh oh, I'm sorry. I, got to, I have your microphone there. There we go. Good morning. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. And thank you for calling me young. <laughs> I appreciate that. Hey, look, we are forever young. Okay, how does that song go? I wanna be forever young. 
and you are only as old as you feel, right? So, so yes. uh, uh, tell everyone a little bit about Casey. Casey is currently a library media specialist with Washington DC school system. Um, she has previously worked in, as the lead librarian for the East St. Louis School District. All right, uh, an area library coordinator for Chicago Public Schools and a district coordinator for the Mayor Daily Book Club for middle school students. All right, now uh, uh, she is she uh, she has uh, her blog, the Audacious Librarian, her, has documents her work with K-12 students, discusses the effective use of technology in K-12 education and provides helpful book reviews. Additionally, she is a sought after and popular keynote speaker and conference presenter at local, state, and national levels. And Casey also has some Louisiana roots here, okay? She also has some Louisiana roots. You wanna tell everyone about yourself a little bit? Yeah, I'm going to talk about my Louisiana roots and how I owe so much to Louisiana. Um, yep. But I'm KC for short. And uh, this is my 23rd year of teaching. So I've seen a lot. I've experienced a lot. And there's been a horde of children that I have serviced through my library media center program <laughs> in the three districts I've worked in. So it's been a very fulfilling uh, career. And I just, it just get, continues to get better and better and better and better. Awesome. Awesome. So I am going to throw it over to you so that you can share your screen at this time. I know you have some awesome uh, content for us this morning. So I'll let you go ahead and share your screen. You ready for that? Okay. And everyone, if you could still, while she's pulling that up, if you could go ahead and still uh, drop in the chat right now on whatever platform you are joining from, go ahead and uh, let us know where you are joining us from. All right. Let us know where you are joining us from. All right. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Cover Everybody there, there and I am going to go see my screen. Yes, you are good. Okay, great. There we go. Okay, well, I'm going to get started. Good morning, good morning, and good morning. Uh, I'm KC, and I'm going to give this presentation. It's called The Hidden Figure, Your School Librarian. And I really want to do a deep dive into this because uh, this is such an important topic now uh, as we are going through our COVID-19 pandemic experience. And I always start my presentations off by saying this. I'm a library media specialist and it's the best job on the planet. I don't care how corny that sounds to you. It sounds just so correct to me. I really enjoy serving as a school library media specialist for the last now 23 years. So it's my passion, it's my love, and I'm just so glad that I chose this field. So I wanted to talk about Louisiana. I owe so much to the state of Louisiana. First and foremost, um, my parents are both from Louisiana. My dad was born in New Orleans, a charity hospital, and then his family moved to Baton Rouge when he was a young boy. My mother is from Shreveport. And what's interesting is that during the Great Migration, half my family went to California and the other half went to Chicago. So we have deep roots in the, in the city. I have relatives that are still living in the Baton Rouge in the New Orleans area. I'm a second generation graduate of Southern University. Woo woo, SU. Okay. And I was the president of the Association of Women Students for two years. Um, during that time, I worked with Senator Cle then Senator Cleo Fields with the uh, voter registration drive. And uh, I was also made an honorary senator for the state of Louisiana. And it was during that time when David Duke was running for office. Uh, I worked with, um, at that time, Kent, Dr. Kent Smith Jr., 
who is now a university president. Um, and we really got the vote out for the students at Southern University during that time. So I owe a lot to Louisiana. I, I still make a good pot of gumbo as well. So you can't tell me nothing about my gumbo. I know what I'm doing. All right. So this is a little bit more about me. Um, I, you can follow me at Boss Librarian at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Um, you can also uh, just see some of the things that I'm involved with right now. I sit on a number of boards. My hand is in a lot of different um, activities and programs. I stay very busy, but for the good of the children. Uh, so that's me pretty much in a nutshell what I'm responsible for this year. Now, I want to give this presentation from the lens of a librarian, but I want to direct it to those of you who are on this webinar or going to see this, this recording that are not familiar with school librarians. Um, I know that there's a lot of librarians on this, this uh, webinar series. That's great. But I want to focus this talk today on those of you who are not very familiar with the role that your school librarian plays in your school. First and foremost, there are four career paths for librarians. The first is academic. These are your university and junior college librarians. They're your specialty librarians that work through the universities. Then you have public librarians. They interface with the public, the general public, day to day. They provide a tremendous amount of wonderful programs, not only for children, but for young adults and adults. Uh, school libraries. Of course, this is where I come in. Um, you, we work, uh, librarians that work in the school, and I wanted to be very clear, in certain states, we are certified teachers. So I have a certification in K-12 education. And a lot of times my colleagues don't think that I even have a degree. But um, yes, we are teachers as well as we all have masters in information library science in order to do the jobs that we're doing. And the last career path of a librarian is special libraries. So you have like the Library of Congress. You have librarians that are law librarians, medical librarians, special librarians. Like, believe it or not, do you know that there are librarians that work at Disney World? They need them because they have to uh, archive and organize special collections for the organization, which is Disney. And you can only imagine they have a tremendous amount of content that they have to organize and keep track of. So that's the four career paths of librarians, just to kind of give you a little background about us as a whole. Now, when it comes to school library information science, uh, there are researchers and I'm going to be talking from the lens again as a school librarian and keep in mind what I'm saying, a lot of the things that I'm going to discuss today, they are not what just Casey believes and Casey, you know, thinks should be, but it's more so it's rooted in research. Look at all the researchers that are listed here. These are some of the top researchers that I look to whenever I have to write a speech give a presentation or even present at a school board meeting. So you have Dr. Keith Curry Lance, Dr. Ken Haycock, Dr. Kafi Kamatsi, Dr. Stephen Krashen, Dr. Joyce Valenza, and Deborah Cachell. All of these practitioners write uh, for uh, different uh, journals. They do a tremendous amount of research that pushes the needle forward in the area of library information science as it applies to school librarians. So today's school librarian, let me just give you a breakdown. They're literacy experts. Okay, first and foremost, they know what books the kids want to and do not want to read. They definitely know that. Okay. Uh, the next one is tech, technology guru. A lot, there's a lot of misinformation around this area. Um, many feel that the only thing librarians know are just, just the books. But when we are earning our degrees in library information science, part of the curriculum that we have to uh, engage in, it deals heavily with technology because many of the tools that we use in the K-12 platform our technology rooted and they're based. And we'll talk a little bit more about examples of that, of how I've used it, as well as colleagues have, have used technology effectively. Um, we're curriculum um, mavens. You know, 
we know curriculum. We know how to connect those great resources to a standard curriculum, whether it be a school curriculum, district curriculum, state curriculum, or even national curriculums. We know how to connect the, the dots. We know how to, to bring those lessons to life. The next is digital citizenship uh, fellow. We have to show our kids by modeling, by telling, and also by, by uh, just most importantly, this is this plain example, how important it is to conduct themselves properly online, what to look for in terms of dangers that are out there, because unfortunately we have people that do not have the best intentions for our kids online. Um, last but not least is that we want our students to be proficient users of technology and information as it applies online. There's fake news and then there's not, uh, act, there's actually accurate news. How do our kids know the difference? This is where digital citizenship comes into play. Last but not least, today's school librarian is a leader. You have to allow them to lead, but they are leaders in their own right. Some are very vocal, like myself that has a big mouth, and others are very quiet, but they do the same work and they have the same impact. So the school librarians, they're, they're the hid, hidden figures in your school. They established some extremely deep relationships with kids. When I was working in Chicago, we had a K through eighth grade. I was working at K through eighth grade school. The beauty of having the role of a school librarian is that I saw these kids come in the door as kindergarten students. And then years later, they graduate as eighth graders ready for high school. I got to watch firsthand how they develop emotionally, academically, and just as a whole, as a student. That is such a valuable experience and also a treat to watch kids grow. And we have those relationships as they move along the grades in the building. We get to see this firsthand. The next thing is we work very quietly. Um, and this is also an area that I also criticize librarians with as well, is that sometimes we work so quiet that we do not advocate for ourselves or we do not really share what we're doing. And sometimes it gets perceived that we're not doing anything, you know? So uh, we are quiet workers. We are very observant of what's going on within the life of our buildings. And we just do it. We just do. Our reach is wide. It's very, very long. And it's not just at the school. It extends out into the community and also with different companies and corporations to bring much needed resources into the school for our students. And last but not least, unfortunately, we tolerate stereotypes because I'm going to tell you something. If I get told one more time that I don't look like a librarian, I don't know what I'm going to do. I have tattoos. I have dreadlocks. I am obviously African-American, so therefore I do not fit that stereotypical mode of that white female librarian. I'm just not. I'm me, I'm KC, and I'm a brown girl. Hey, that's how it is. And so sometimes we do have to deal with those stereotypes, not only when it comes to race and gender, but it also comes in with uh, just demeanor, you know. Uh, sometimes people are like, you're so loud and outspoken, you know, you're kind of unusual for a librarian. Well, I got pushed into this kind of you know, box, which I will talk about a little later, because of how librarians as a whole or, or the experiences that I have had as a school librarian. So we do tolerate a lot of stereotypes. So let me just tell you something. If you want to make a librarian angry, do not talk about Lex Isles. <laughs> and this is a meme that I've created of myself because the first year at my school, I was like losing my mind at one of the schools I worked at where uh, the, 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 the teachers were coming in constantly asking about Lex Isle. I need to get this book with this Lex Isle range of this, 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 and this. And I'm just looking like, you got to be kidding me. And I knew I had a lot of work ahead of me to straighten out that, that type of mentality. And if you're not familiar with Lexiling, Lexiling is a system that essentially is created to um, connect kids with books that's directly tied in with their reading level. 
librarians do not like to use lexiling for this main reason. We want to give kids the freedom to read. So if a student wants to read a Muhammad Ali book and it's outside of their lexile range, a librarian looks at it from this perspective. Let them read it because if it's too high and above their level, they're going to struggle and they're going to make sure that they learn how to read that book, understand those those words, understand the story or the uh, or the, the the content that's presented to them, and it will serve as a healthy challenge for them. So yeah, if you want to really make a, a librarian angry, this just come in and talk about Lex Island. That's a really issue. That's a real touchy issue with librarians. So we're extremely passionate on a number of subjects, including Lex Island, that um, that we see as trends in K-12 education. So yes, are there challenges? There surely are in um, the library world. Um, you know, some of the challenges that, you know, as a, a colleague, as someone who works in the building, you might not be aware of because librarians just don't articulate it very well. We are very quiet about it and we deal with these problems in silence um, because uh, uh, think about it, you're the only per the librarian is the only person of its type in that of in, in the in a building. When you are a classroom teacher, you are surrounded by other classroom teachers and you can kind of band together and really make a point to the principal. But when you're a school librarian or even a music teacher, an art teacher, a technology teacher, it's only you going in and having that discussion with the principal. And it's kind of difficult sometimes. So here's an example of some challenges. Um, I found in my 23 years that the educators are oftentimes uneducated when it comes to the role of the school librarian and the impact that it can make on student achievement. And this is where it's really sad. I've always been advocating and, and arguing the point that these principal and superintendent pre preparation programs really need to add a unit or some type of focus on ancillary programs in every school and they make sure that they include the school librarian in that description. Um, ignoring the multiple skills of the librarian. Uh, I've had principals that thought that, okay, the only thing you know is books and that's it. But then they didn't include me on uh, leadership curriculum teams to talk about how we're going to roll out technology, these digital uh, applications that were going to be loaded on iPads. They didn't have those discussions with me and I was kept out of the room and not in invited to the table to have the discussion. So these are some of the uh, additional challenges that we experience. Um, of course, with any program in the building, including classroom teachers, financial support for anything that you're trying to do in the schoolhouse with the kids is always a, a big plus. But oftentimes the school library is viewed as a very expensive program. And we have to move away from that mindset of libraries expensive. Well, we invest in the classroom classroom too as, re as well, right? We don't call the classroom expensive, but when we have an opportunity to write off certain departments or budgets within the building. Oftentimes the library program is the first one on the list, you know, so this is a challenge. Um, leadership that won't acknowledge that they need guidance around how the librarian or the library program can impact student achievement. My current principal, when he hired me, you know what he said? And this was the best thing he could have ever said to me coming through the door. He said, I've never worked with a certified librarian. You're going to have to help me with this. He had always had um, paraprofessionals working in the library, teacher aides. So I was his first certified librarian. Now, there's days he's like, I really wish I could send her back where she came from. <laughs> but I will be honest with you that the, at, in the, at the end of the day, I, I truly believe that he sees that there's value in the work that I'm doing and, and, and what I provide, not only to our students, but our teachers and our parents. So, you know, a leader that is willing to be open and, um, and acknowledge not knowing and to be a little vulnerable is okay with me because it gives me a platform of where I, I need to do the work in order to have them understand a little better what I do and how I can impact student achievement and also make their school better. 
you know? So these are some of the challenges that you that librarians experience coming in the door, sometimes dealing with our not only our, our principals, but our district administrators. So continuing on, I'm just going to put this quote out here. This is so true. Librarians are truly the equalizer in K-12 education. Why we impact all departments within our buildings, the entire curriculum. We touch every student. We interact with our community members. We interact with our civic leaders, our local, our, our local movers and shakers. We really can make a difference in our school communities. And so we're that equalizer in K-12 education. We are the equity kings and queens. We ensure that kids have access to those much needed materials and it's fair and most importantly, it's equitable. So I'm gonna use myself as an example. This is my story and I'm gonna go through a couple of slides where I'm gonna talk about um, some experiences that I have had working as a school librarian in now three school districts, okay? So my first school district that I started to work in was Chicago Public Schools. And I had multiple roles. I worked at the uh, elementary, then middle, high school, and administration levels. And it was a very rich experience. And as Wiley mentioned in uh, the introduction, when I worked in administration, I had an opportunity to work with the uh, mayor and then Mayor Daly, Richard Daly's um, education team. And we had a citywide book club program. And I ran the book club program for the middle schoolers. It was about 3,000 kids that participated. And at the end of the year, we had a culminating event where we brought in authors from all over the country. They gave presentations. Kids got free books. It was just a literary event all day long, this different presentations that dealt with reading at a preteen and high school level. So that those are that's some of the examples of the work I've done that's been high end and then also very quietly at the school level. So here's a couple of slides to kind of share with you some highlights of my time there. Um, I'm going to start with, um, I should put these in a little better order, but I'm going to start with the upper right hand corner. Um, the last school I worked at was called Wendell Phillips Academy High School. I was the recipient of a two-year grant called Vital and Revital, where I was one of the first librarians in the district that received um, MacBook Pros, iPads, uh, Nooks from Barnes & Noble at the time, um, and the, just given free reign to do anything creative to use that technology. Of course, I integrated a lot of the activities and classes, worked with a lot of teachers with different uh, unit projects and so forth, but I also kicked it up a level where um, I created a TV news program called Behind the Pause. And I was an intern at WAFB in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. My degree was mass communications for television when I was at Southern. So I, kind of reached back and grabbed all those great, you know, television skills. And I applied it to this television show that I did with the kids. It ran for three years. We have mul multiple um, episodes. Sometimes we had two to three episodes per month. And then sometimes it, there were, sometimes that there were special events that Dr. Uh, Devon Horton would have us um, uh, cover and so forth. So we did a lot of great content and material during that time. So much so it caught the attention of uh, district leadership because they were like, what, a librarian's doing all this? Um, and also too, I had a, just a wonderful group of kids during that, that, um, that, that period of time. So wonderful that um, we were one of the first schools in the district that used social media before the district even came up with a social media policy. So my students were tweeting using Pinterest. They were using Instagram, Facebook, uh, Vine at the time, but you know, that's kind of gone away. Um, but that, but what we did was that we talked a lot about the positive things that Wendell Phillips Academy high school students were doing. And if you know the city, the school was located on is located on the south side of the city. 
It's located in a um, challenging neighborhood. And this school for 23 years was second to last in test scores, reading test scores in particular, for the state of Illinois. So I was brought in as a new librarian, um, along with a horde of other new teachers because they were turning the school around. And as a result of that, I got a lot of uh, funding to um, build a print collection for the students. So a lot of books came in. And, and even though we were doing some great things, we had Golden Apple teachers, students, and you know, winning, award, uh, winning little awards here and there, the district really was not acknowledging us at all. So as a result of that, I decided that, hey, let's, let's try social media. It's free and we can control it. We changed the narrative of Phillips High School where it's not, not just known as a powerhouse in football and other sports, it's also known as a tech, it was also known as a technology integrator, as well as a rising academic uh, star school. And so here's a picture of me with my behind the pause crew. And at that time, um, sent, uh, education secretary Arnie Duncan was in town. He came to the school to visit the school because the school had turned around so much and he actually came to my library and my computer lab. So that's a picture of us standing there with um, me and my students at that time. So I also got in a lot of trouble, good trouble during that time because I was promoting a genre that was pretty uh, controversial and it's called street literature. And I still do to this day because as I mentioned, I received a, um, a tremendous amount of money to rebuild the print collection because it had gone dormant for so long in the history of the school. And um, I incorporated essentially books uh, from this genre that represented the lot, some of the lives of my students. And I learned very early on that if I provided books that provided a blueprint of how kids could deal with life issues and problems that mirrored themselves and their communities, kids would gravitate back to reading. So some of these kids had not picked up an independent reading book since then, since they were in the third grade. The only reading that they were doing was required reading in class or reading online for um, for pleasure. So to have students pick up a, phys a physical book was really monumental. And I credit um, Dr. Vanessa um, um, Irvin Morris. She wrote the book called the, um, the Reader's Advisory Guide to Street Literature. It was a really good guide for me in doing this work and bringing this genre into a uh, school collection that was greatly needed. So my second district, I worked in, it's called um, East St. Louis School District um, 189 in East St. Louis, Illinois. And as I mentioned earlier, um, I worked for a wonderful principal named Dr. Devon Horton. Well, he left Phillips and he went down state Illinois to this small district. And in um, going to the small district, he worked down there as the assistant superintendent. And he observed that the library program was really in disarray and um, the reading scores really needed a boost. And so he convinced me to leave Chicago because I'm a Chicago girl, okay? He convinced me to leave Chicago and come to a small city in downstate Illinois, which I did. And um, during those two years, I worked heavily with a group of librarians to turn around and build their library programs. They had never had a circulation system or electronic circulation system that kept track of, track of books that were checked out. So we had 10 campuses, each li the librarians as a team went to each campus and we actually went in and scanned every single book into a giant catalog for Alexandria at the time. It took us eight months. But because um, and also to the school district, because they didn't have a librarian, they were just buying buying books for the library, but they didn't understand the importance of mark records and retaining them. So a lot of that was thrown out. And then also, too, there was some problems with uh, the previous vendors. We couldn't get the mark records from them. So we had to just start from scratch because um, I, if I was going to do it, I was going to do it correctly. It took us eight months. The first time the students actually checked out books and took them home. That was a big thing for this district. And as of June 1st, um, 2017, 15,757 books were checked out in one school year. 
that says a lot. We have really moved the needle uh, in this area. I worked there for two years and uh, I felt that my, my work was done and I ended up getting called to another district, which was the District of Columbia Public Schools where I work right now. And I work at Jefferson Academy. At Jefferson Academy, it's been a very interesting experience because as soon as I got there, I learned, oh, guess what? Your school is going to be remodeled. You're getting a brand new library. Yay, that's great. Great news, right? But it also called for me to pack up all the books and it had to, the books had to be sent into storage for a year. And then I kept a small percentage of the books because I had a small library in a temporary trailer. So I called it the trailer life. I lived in a trailer for a year, you know, uh, operating my small library. And then this year we got to move into the brand new space. And unfortunately, <laughs> what, what happened was uh, COVID-19 took place. So I didn't get to enjoy it for very long, but we'll be back. You know, I'm, I'm a very optimistic person. We will be back. So Jefferson Academy is located in Southwest DC. It is a school that is uh, experiencing gentrification right now. So we're having a shift in kids that are, uh, are starting to attend the school. Over on the left-hand side, that's one of my favorite um, uh, photos. That's Brother Rashad coming from the graphic novel section. He just picked out his favorite graphic novel to check out for the umpteenth time because he has gone through all the entire collection and he checks out the book for the second, third, sometime, fourth time. But that's okay. As long as he's happy. So um, I run a very um, a loose ship. I'm very approachable with the kids. Uh, I take the attitude of it's what you want to read. That's what we're going to focus on. Okay. So uh, my commitment is providing service. I am focused on getting my young black boys reading because some of them are not reading. And that is a huge challenge um, at this point um, with getting them engaged in reading. And then also introducing the kids to technology tools using like do ink apps, you know, one of the AASL, uh, AASL's best uh, apps for I think it was 2016 and just giving them that exposure that, Hey, we can have fun in here with technology. And this is a lighthearted area, no pressure, right? So virtual learning and the fight to serve students. When COVID-19 hit, this was me in the beginning. I was like, Oh my God, what am I going to do? How am I going to figure this out? You know? And it, it took me a minute to kind of figure out how can I do this? What is my place? And how can I best serve my students? So I went through a lot of soul searching and I said, okay, I want to keep these kids reading in the, in the, and connected in the virtual world. Yes, print books are great, but now we have to move even deeper into an ebook collection. I always had ebooks in my, my collection, but now because we were in COVID, experiencing a pandemic, we had to do a deeper dive into using, um, uh, uh, ebook to, uh, technologies. So what has the last couple of months taught us? A lot of things is that in some school districts, some librarians are underutilized. This is problematic. They're kind of viewed at like, okay, well, we don't need librarians right now. And I know New York city is going through this really bad right now. They have the viewpoint of, well, because librarians are only, are not in a brick and mortar environment, um, they're not needed. And we're needed even more so than before because in my, I can speak for my district, not only are we leading the charge with um, ebook technologies, but we're also providing that much needed support in using Microsoft Teams, which is our main platform for live lessons. And then also using Canvas for additional um, uh, connected resources. This is important because Canvas is not, as easy as one would think it is to, to log on and connect and to set up your page and everything. It takes a minute to kind of get your mind, your mind wrapped around it. Librarians have been in my district. Not only did they create front, front facing pages for their particular schools, but they've also assisted the teachers in developing their front facing pages for their classrooms. And we need these tools because that's how we can better service our students. Librarians were a big part of that. And also too, there's a lot of confusion about how school librarians could just be used in the virtual world. You know, 
uh, I, I, a lot of the things that I do in the face-to-face world, which is uh, research, support, technology integration, getting kids encouraged to read is the same things I, I do in a, when I pop into classes uh, through Microsoft Teams. Same thing. So yes, that and, and with my district, they started to shift in their, their mindset in terms of how we could possibly be used. So I created a couple of things. Um, the first is with literacy service and justice for all. And I want to try and conclude so we'll have some time so we can um, uh, I can deal with questions and answers. So I'm going to go through these last couple of slides. So we'll have that time together. Uh, I created this initiative because I wanted to still send print books to kids. While ebook technology is great, there's still a percentage of kids that really like to feel the physical book. So through my Instagram account, what I do is I um, say, hey, to the kids, hey, the first five, in this case, this was during a um, PD. I said, the first five teachers that send me an email um, with JA readers in the subject line will win a free book. With the kids, I tell them, if you follow me on Instagram, and I don't follow kids back. I make that very clear. Um, if you follow me on Instagram and, you know, from time to time, I will have different uh, giveaways and freebies. And I do it through Amazon, my Amazon account. Um, I have some people that are very generous and they they like the work that I'm doing. And you will find that, too. When people see that you're really trying to do the right thing by kids, they'll say, what do you need? I could, I could send you a $25 Amazon card or a $100 Amazon card to help those kids. See, this is what I'm talking about. When you extend yourself out into the community and you let people know what you're doing, people will be willing to help you. So that's how I've developed this program, just to, you know, to get books, physical books and other goodies in the hands of the kids. I've also committed to a couple of other things, which is when the kids were coming into the building, because we're 100 percent virtual um, at my in my uh, in my district, I wanted to still give them those uh, wonderful print books. So I got a donation through a local professor who follows me on Twitter. See the benefits of social media again. And she, uh, we, we met this summer and she gave me a ton of books, not just for uh, books for my students to read, which is sixth through eighth grade, but also she included books for younger children in the home. So I created a little packets, you know, I got a gallon bags of the, you know, um, of Ziploc bags. First and foremost, I quarantined the books for two weeks to be on the safe side. Then I had a COVID-19 test already, so I, but I still put a mask on, put my gloves on. I prepared each packet, filled out a little note card, and then I took it up to the school. I put it on a table and gave instructions to the office staff that when parents come in to pick up their child's Chromebook, please encourage them to pick up a pack of books and it's free for them. Those parents are running out the door with those packs of books, and that's a good thing, right? Okay, so the other thing I'm committed to is learning as well as teaching my colleagues in the building all these various platforms this year. I am getting deep into Wakelet. So if you have a Wakelet account, follow me because I want to learn from you and I'm still learning myself. But we use Sora. We are using the DC Public Library, Orville Drive. Um, we're also using Epic Books. I know it's not listed there. We're just getting into Epic Books. So, and of course, Common Sense Education. Buncee is another one that I'm going to be using with not only students and, and teachers. And then, of course, Gale and Context Middle School. We have a partnership with the public library, so we're able to access those materials there. So, I got into some good trouble. 2016, I had the fortunate opportunity to meet uh, the late John Lewis. And what I walked away from his speech was understanding that um, as a child, I was always problematic to my late father, who I was always the one that was catching it because I wasn't following directions in the house. And um, one of the things that I was told was stay out of trouble. I was always reminded, stay out of trouble. Well, John Lewis taught me that it's okay to get in trouble, but good trouble. So the good trouble that I've gotten into is advocating for um, students in Ward 7 and 8, which is a brown and black neighborhood in D.C., where they have removed librarians. And I feel that it could have been worse, but 
because librarians and I in this district began to amplify our voices and talk about how unfair and inequitable this is and the importance that it wasn't about the jobs, it was the service. The students needed to receive the service of a certified, I want to be clear, certified and trained school librarian to provide them with that the resources and the service that they needed. Good trouble is a good thing. So yes, my chancellor or superintendent cannot stand me because I have really been amplifying my voice, but at the end of the day, I am um, working for the good of kids. And so a good friend of mine, Dr. Pamela Moore, um, was kind of fussing at me one day and she said, you know what, you advocate, but you are an activist. And it took me a long time for me to accept that until I did a library career conversations with Shamika Simpson out of California. And she put on a slide to advertise it, activists. And I said, you know what? Dr. Moore was right. Librarians need to move from being just advocates and they should be always advocates at all time, but they also need to be activists. You have got to be an activist for this field because if you don't, you're gonna get stepped all over. So I say this to you, if they don't give you a seat at the table, Shirley Chisholm, Sister Shirley Chisholm said, bring your folding chair. You've got to be in the room when they make decisions. And if they try to keep you out, find a way in. If you have to stand in the corner, stand in the corner. But just do it. Just do it. And then drawing on even more inspiration. Dr. King said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. Are we going to be complicit? with a lot of this rhetoric and craziness that's going on, I couldn't be complicit about kids not having a library service. I have wonderful library service for my school and public library. I want the same thing for my students. That's all that I'm, I'm advocating for, not just my students, but the students in my district and across this country. So it's important. You have to draw on your community support and also organizations that can provide you with support. Black Caucus of the American Library Association, American Library Association, Associate, American Association for School Librarians. Yes, I'm going to read them all. Washington Teachers Union, the Ward 6 Parent, um, parent Teacher Organization, Every Library, DECAL, which is DC uh, Library Association, and DC Equity and DC Education all of these organizations I've gone to and I said, I need your support. It could be something simple like, can you retweet this on your page? Can you please write a letter? Can you please stand with us on this issue? And all of them have. And that's the blessing in this. That's the blessing right there to have that type of support. So is this work easy? Nope, it's not. It's difficult, but you have to push through adversity. And I'm going to leave these slides with Wiley because we're um, getting close to our time. But you can see these are some of the areas where I'd say, OK, when I'm pushing through diversity. Yeah, I get mad like the next person. I get really ticked off. But then after I get mad, I start getting strategic. And when I get quiet and start thinking, then that is really going to move the needle on whatever topic or subject that. I feel needs to have more attention brought to it. So how can you help? Get to know your school librarian. If you've been passing by the library and you just don't, you, uh, and you just say good morning and that's it, that's great. But go in and just see what she's doing or he's doing. They'll tell you. Advocate for librarians. You can do something simple, posting something on your Facebook page, signing a petition, for example. Share stories of collaboration. You know, when you're in a staff meeting, you know, teachers on this on this webinar, technology teachers as well, just stand up and say, hey, I partnered with the librarian and we did this little short activity and this is great. Sometimes just that little short testimonial will make the difference in others that have thought about working with the librarian and now they're saying, well, if this person worked with them, let me see if I can get some help. It's always worked at my school. So I'm, about, I'm just going to be very blunt and tell you. But how can you help? 
librarians across the country, go to every library. Every library is a, a grassroots uh, political action group that supports librarians in all of the career paths. But they have a special page called um, Safe School Librarians. If you want to see where there's threats in this country that deal with school librarians and you want to sign a petition that will get the attention of the school board or community members or get that, that issue on the referendum in that community, just sign the petition. Visit safeschoollibrarians.org. So I want to say thank you for your attention, your time today. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, boss underscore librarian. I do have a private Instagram page for this reason. I have students and unfortunately I have vendors that will friend me and then they start bothering the people that follow me and, and doing a lot of uh, cold calling. So I decided about a year ago, I'm making it totally private. So if you would like to friend me on Instagram, I want to be very clear on this. I need you somewhere in your bio to say I'm an educator, classroom teacher, technology teacher, art teacher, librarian. Make sure in your bio it tells me who you are because if you just have your name, I'm not going to accept it because I value the privacy of the people that follow me. I want to protect my students that follow me. And I just don't want anyone that is not going to be positive to have access to my page. So that being said, everything else is open. You can see anything that I'm doing, but I do a lot of work on Instagram. That's where I spend the majority of my time. So I want to say thank you. I'm going to stop sharing my page. I think you all have seen my website and I'm pretty certain Wiley put it in the chat a couple of times. So I'm going to exit out and come back to the main page here. There we go. All right. Yes. Thing. My cat just jumped on the. <laughs> I know, I know. It's it's like every time I do one of these, one of my pets comes in the room. So, over the last three weeks, I've done about sixteen webinars, and I swear, between the kids or the cat, one of them has been in a, in a recording. And again, here's a cat. So sorry about that, guy. Yes, yes, yes. Look, I I, I definitely. Uh, I put into the chat, you know, um, that they did not, I bet you they did not know that they were coming to get a sermon on a good Saturday morning here. You definitely <laughs> gave a word this morning and great, great info, Casey. Um, I got see. those Louisiana that, roots. That's why it's Louisiana roots. Come on, we greatness. Come on. That's what I'm here talking about. And look, we see you in the background there with your Southern University jacket there. I absolutely love it. Yes, that is my alma mater as well. Yes, you, Definitely. HBCUs. Uh, so, so if everyone, if anyone has questions, let's make sure that we get them into the chat. Uh, oh. There are a couple of questions that came up um while you were speaking that i am going to put one of them on the screen for you now and this question comes from the unknown ism is there a book list for street literature that you can maybe like refer them to if you go if you go to streetliterature.com um, it's Vanessa Irvin Morris's, uh, um, former, uh, page cause she doesn't post to it anymore, but she had the street lit book awards. If you were to Google that, there are some book lists that will pop up that way. So between the streetliterature.com, um, and it's also a blog post, a blog site, as well as, um, the street lit yeah book award list, you'll be able to find some old book, book lists that are there. Awesome. Awesome. And I did want to make sure I forgot to do one thing before I got into that question. I also wanted to give the resource of our Louisiana Library Association exactly. as well. And that is the website that is linked right there. And we had a presenter, uh, Louisiana librarian here. 
uh, named Amanda Jones. So shout out mm -hmm. to you, Amanda Jones. And I want to make sure we congratulate yep. her um, as right. the Louisiana School Library, the LASL School Librarian of the Year the this year. year. Yes. So, um, definitely shout out to you, Amanda, as well. Okay, so let's jump back into uh, the questions here. Um, got a lot of awesome like comments that you know that goosebumps and all of those things. Like loving the content. Uh, oh, here we go, right here. How from Michelle Lewis? How did you know when you crossed the threshold? between advocating and being an activist, was there a defining moment? Mm. Um, it happened recently with uh, DC Public uh, Schools. Um, the, the district has been receiving accolades for the last three to four years for academic gains in reading but then they wanted to close their library programs. Now I want to be very clear. The work is in the classroom, but librarians are part of that equation. Why would you want to close library programs if you have these academic gains taking place? It, it's crazy. You're giving principals autonomy to close library programs and we're doing so well. And that's what did it for me. That's what really did it for me. It's like I was quietly thinking about it in 2016 after hearing that John Lewis speech. But then when it got pushed in my face, I was like, am I going to be complicit or am I going to speak up and say something? And that's that was the turning point. Definitely. That is awesome. Um, and here's another question uh, from Susan. Many of her colleagues have expressed worry that promoting activists versus advocates sends the wrong negative message. Uh, and then how do you how do how can she can help convince them otherwise and get into that good trouble? Well, um, Dr. King was an advocate, was an activist, right? During his time when he was living before he was assassinated, Dr. King was viewed as a troublemaker, a rebel rouser. Now, years later, we glorify his name and, oh, he was so wonderful. But my mother always reminds me that when um, back in the late 60s, it, you know, people viewed him as a, a problematic person. I think that people have to move into that mindset that when you speak out, it just doesn't mean that you're being negative. You're just pointing out that here's an inequity that's taking place and we really need to work, work on it. And then I also look at the receiver. If, if you're having a problem with me speaking my mind in a democratic society and having the right to, to, to say some things that are passionate for me and you can't value that, then, you know, I, I'll just move keep doing my work and eventually you'll catch a clue and catch up so long story short i i i, I have no time or patience for people that are like oh you're being negative okay how explain how if i'm just pointing out that these kids are being treated unfairly i always yeah. throw the words right back at a person like that most definitely but good question Good question, because that's a that's that's a real issue. That's a very real issue. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And 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 the thing about it is one of my favorite thing, one of my favorite quotes is that, you know, um, even going back to uh, uh, Martin Luther King, you know, um, um, you know, um, silence. If you how does it go? Basically, like uh, if you are silent in the face of injustice, you're basically contributing to that injustice. So uh, let's jump into another question here. Um, right here. Uh, how would you suggest building community with students when you're in a new school mm -hmm. library in this pandemic? That is no, another great, great question. That's extremely tough. 
it's extremely tough. I have a friend that just started, she made, she moved from the public to the school library system. And yeah, it, that, it, that it's really hard. And I've been trying to give her as well as another friend of mine, some suggestions. Um, I would first tap in with your, um, your teachers that have been in the building for a long time. That means that they know those families. That's one. Two is if you have any type of parent driven organization that supports the, the, stu the school, if it's not formal, maybe it's informal. Like you have a couple of very vocal parents, you know, oftentimes those vocal parents are on their own Facebook groups and they start talking am among each other. Um, tap into a newsletter for the school. Any type of communication, it could even be social media. And just start small. Don't start big, start very small. If you have an ebook collection, highlight the ebook collection and how the kids can get on. If you want to take it a step further, you could say, I can do little tutorial sessions, or I can make a recording where I'm showing you step by step. This is how you get onto the site. Partner with the public library. But place an email, send an email to your children's librarian and say, hey, I'm new in the area. I'm trying to get some things up and going. What do you have going on in your building that's online? Maybe share some resources in that respect. But I would start very small. And I know it's t it's, it gets frustrating because you see people doing a lot of high end stuff right now. You know, uh, but if you're just starting out, I think you need to stick to the very, very basics of just getting kids access to reading. And how can they get access to reading? It would be through obviously ebooks. What ebook uh, opportunities are there? And if you don't have that opportunity, there are some companies that are providing access to free ebooks. It just takes a little, you know, digging. I would start with AASL, your state library organization. They should have some type of comprehensive comprehensive list. And then on social media, if you belong to a lot of those those Facebook groups, they give out a ton of great information. I just don't have the time like I used to to really deep dive into them. But there's always a lot of great information that's shared there. Uh, school librarians workshop, learning librarians, anti-racist school librarians, those three top um, you know, uh, sites, they share a tremendous amount of information and you can join them. Awesome. 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 And I think that's all of the questions uh, that we have. Wait, there's one last one that just came in. I'm going to put okay. that one on the screen. Um, any suggestions on how to build that book relationship that a librarian would when there is no librarian all remotely? It's difficult. Because that's what the librarian does for you. Your district has opted, obviously, not to have a school librarian, right? Um, I, if you are, uh, trying to think of some some sites off the top of my head that you could tap into. Um, well. Let's start with the littles. Um, I just finished a um, project with Netflix with book uh, book links, and it's a new TV show that's on uh, Netflix right now, and it it's highlighting African American titles. Okay, so this is an example of that where if you want to you know connect kids with books and just get them in the mindset of reading, you know what what this TV show through uh, Netflix is doing is that they are um, having books read aloud to the kids on screen. And you can watch that from the comfort of your home. So there are others, uh, stations, PBS, um, Storybook Online is another one that will read out loud to the little ones, you know, um, with the, with middle school and high school, There's some YouTube series and I would have to, if I could get your, your contact information, I can do a little more research for you and send you some exact links. Cause I'm not, it's not coming in my brain right now. I just turned 50 this year. So look, 
Sometimes it doesn't stick. But there are some resources that you could use for the middle schoolers and high schoolers just to get the kids engaged in reading. And it's free. I'm just not thinking of it at the top of my head. I'm so sorry. Um, but yeah, please, please, please. Thank you, Joyce. I see my one of my friends on YouTube. There's there's yeah. some um, yeah on YouTube. You can access the uh, the Netflix series as well. So um, that's another option for you. Okay. If you don't have a Netflix account, you can also access it through YouTube. Do, you know. Do you have time for this one more last question? Yeah, sure. Sure. First off, I want to. Uh, uh, let them give you that comment right there. <laughs> and then... <laughs> Thank you. I don't feel it sometimes. <laughs> and then... And then... And uh, and she just dropped her email in the chat. And so I'm not going to put her email there up there for everyone. But I will put this last question. Uh, how can we motivate students to reading apart from their curriculum or program. So basically reading for pleasure. How do you promote that? Look, you, you got to know what kids are interested in. Okay. I'll give you an example with my kids at my building. They are nuts about um, anime and comics. So if they're interested in this, when I'm in Get Epic, for example, that's a free resource. Uh, to C.D. Bronner at cps.edu. Well, cps.edu, okay, you're from Chicago. Okay, so if you're, if if you, you know, I know that these kids love this particular um, uh, genre. So when I created classes in my Epic Books catalog for my students, what I did was I started loading automatically all of the graphic novels and the anime that I thought that they would enjoy reading. OK, and I created a collection for them. And so now that they've been invited to my class, I told them by Thursday, I want to see some activity, made it a lighthearted assignment for them. And already they're going in and they're looking at those books on the site. So that's one way that you can get them engaged in reading is that when you know what they're interested in, then you can identify blocks of books that you can expose them to. Um, not only does my district use Epic Books, we are also using Sora. And Sora is wonderful because it's a combination of your ebook collection at your school district, as well as the public library, and it comes together. So you can really engage the kids and uh, just a whole plethora of books that they can check out. I can assign books to kids as well. So, you know, uh, it goes back to what you, when you know your kids, what they're interested in or generally have an idea, then they will read independently on their own because they're reading for interest. You know, uh, so I would take that approach. And thank you, Joyce. Valenza. I said book links. I meant to say bookmarks. Boy, see that 50 year old brain again, you know. But anyway, um, I do want you guys to please please, please make sure that, um, you know, if, if you're, that you're getting started in the field, you know, follow me on social media because I do drop things, you know, that will be helpful. And like, in that case, that would be very helpful resource, you know, to use like between Epic and Sora, because you can really engage a lot of reading uh, uh, readers that way. Awesome. Awesome. And so that's all the questions that we have. And look, I will say that this has been awesome. I even learned a lot this morning uh, <laughs> and have and have an even higher value. I had one before, but even higher value now for the school librarians. And so, again, we want to say thank you for your excellence. Um, all of the uh, school librarians, I do want to give a, a shout out to our state association one more time, the Louisiana uh, Library uh, Association as well. And we have uh, our very own Amanda Jones, who was yes. uh, this year's uh, school librarian of the year. 
And then last week, I do want to say, if you are not familiar with Family Book Form, uh, it is a uh, an awesome resource. We just did a uh, a webinar on it last yeah. week. We had the founder of Family Book Form last week. It is available. Of that recording is available on our YouTube channel. It is an awesome tool to be able to allow kids to create and crowdsource books together remotely. It is a super awesome tool. And if you are uh, using that code, you get free access to it. It is like a, a really awesome tool. So uh, See, that's with, what I'm talking about. See? Yeah. And so and in these day and times, having that remote collaboration, going back to even the question someone else was asking earlier, you know, this is, you know, could be another just avenue that you could use. I mean, it's an awesome tool. But um, so thank you again. Let me throw you back up on the screen. If you want to get in touch with uh, and someone said to take uh, do a screen, how to show how to do a screenshot. So um, let's put again your contact information on the screen. So you can reach her at kcboy.com. Yeah. And I'm sure she has all of her social media connected there as well. When I remove this banner, her social media handle is also on her name there. Okay. So bravo, round of applause for you this morning, KC, as well. Okay. Um, we do have some additional professional development opportunities coming up everyone again i just shared uh one that we had last year about the family book form and using that code to get free access to it um but on monday <clears throat> we will also have uh bringing your personality to your classroom with bitmoji and canva with Joycena de Alessandro, she will be here. Registration for okay. that is available on, of course, at gegluisiana.com. All right, if you go there, registration is available there. The recording of this one will be here on the YouTube channel, and then also it will be placed uh, on our website there as well. And this one, Bringing personality to your classroom with Bitmoji and Canva is gonna is really really good because we also have when you join our GEG Louisiana we have like a Bitmoji classroom type of activity to get to know everyone who uh, participates on our GEG distance learning series and so uh, as you've seen earlier we have people from all over the world uh, with it and. Uh, we want to make sure that we connect with everyone and get to know you. So that session on Monday is going to be really, really awesome. We have another session that's uh, a, a recording that's already on there as well about Bitmoji from Jen Hall, which was also awesome. But I'm just continuing to look forward to all of this great, uh, all of these great presenters that are coming. Um, if you would like a... Uh, Oh, I've also got to say, uh, if you would like a a um, certificate yeah. for today's session, you can go to bit.ly slash G-E-G-L-A certificate. And that will bring you to the form where you can complete it and you will be able to get a certificate of attendance for this specific session. Okay. Uh, my contact information is there as well. We definitely also uh, want to say thank you to our sponsors, StreamYard uh, and MyPD247 for uh, for making all of these things possible here. Uh, and StreamYard is helping to expand our reach uh, as well. Again, uh, we have this information that 
that is highly important for you, my contact, the GEG Louisiana, and where you can get your uh, certificate. You can reach Casey at CaseyBoyd.com. This was truly awesome. I enjoyed it thoroughly, thoroughly, Casey, as you saw from some of the comments there as well. Many yeah, I want to read them. I want to read them. Yeah. Yeah, they were there. And if you go back on the YouTube channel as well, all of the comments and everything are there so we can go back through and read them as well. Okay. All right, everyone. Look, we are going to sign off here. Uh, and we definitely thank you for your time and on this good Saturday. Any last words, Casey? You want to say anything? Well, I, I will just say this. It's important that uh, practitioners rest. You have to step away from the computer. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to enjoy my Saturday. And I'm going to pick up one of my many books around here. And I'm reading this one. I'm almost finished. A Fool's Errand. Written by Lonnie Bunch. He is the curator of the African American History Museum here in D.C. So I'm almost done reading this one and I'm going to enjoy my Saturday. So you should, too. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much again, Casey, for being with us and sharing mm -hmm. your time, talents and treasure with us. You're welcome. Right. Everyone, y'all, like Casey said, y'all enjoy the rest of your Saturday and have a good one. OK, bye.